Hello. It's good to see all of you, especially since the world was supposed to end last night. Yeah. <laughs> um, guess what? We're here. And we're worshiping the Lord, and, and that's all good. I think that's probably what God wants us to be doing anyway, right? Not worrying about other things. Well, my name is Mike Cleland, and um, it's great to be your guest preacher, pastor today. Uh, I come most recently from Trinity Baptist in Downey. Some of you may have remembered me back uh, in, in those. I think you were part of our youth group or visited our youth group anyway at the time. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's great, and uh, again, it's good to be here today. Um, if you brought your Bibles, please take a look at Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 12. And we're going to be looking at, at least this is a passage I haven't preached very often, and I don't think I've heard too many sermons about it. Um, it's about, you know, one of the things we see as we read through the book of Acts is a number of different themes, one of them being persecution of the church. I hear people tell me, you know, it would be great to get back to the New Testament church. Have you ever heard that? Mm -hmm. Have you ever said it? It'd be great to get back to the New Testament church. What I always say is, which one are you talking about? Usually, when we think about that, we think of the church of Acts chapter 2. But we don't always think of Acts 4, chapter 8, and chapter 12 and following. So, let's just take a look at this. We're going to be I'm going to be reading from the NIV, verses 1 through 11. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword, and when he saw that this was met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him into prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Think about that for a minute. He was under heavy guard. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. So one of the things we're going to look at this morning is, which is more powerful? Our circumstances or the prayers that can deliver us from our circumstances? And even better yet, the people who are praying for us. Um, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone into the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. And Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening because he thought he was seeing a vision. Like, have you ever had one of those dreams, right? We're so realistic. <laughs> you know, it's a good dream and you don't want it to end. I think that's probably what Peter was thinking here. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. So this is a story about deliverance. It's a story about persecution. And as I alluded to before, as we look at the book of Acts, you cannot see the victories of Acts without the persecutions because they are linked, inevitably linked, and you know, we're not going to have time to look at it all today, but if you go back to chapter 4 and you kind of move forward, especially to chapter 8, and as the uh, book uh, unfolds, you see that there is always ongoing persecution to this early fledgling church, and that some of this persecution takes place over an extended period of time. Over years, in fact. Because even though we read Acts sort of as a moment in time, the truth is, is that the history of the church is going on over a period of years. So it's not like they just had a little bit of trouble and it went away. It's not like they had a bit of persecution and it disappeared. It was something that continued on, and we know from the history of the church that it continued on and got extremely bad toward the end of the first century. 
So, you know, we can, we can read this, and we, we sort of really don't identify in many respects for the physical, intimidating persecution that these folks were going through. Now, we can sort of extrapolate from this and say, well, you know, as a believer today, I may have to endure persecution of a different kind. Maybe you're at a dinner party, or maybe you're talking with people at work, or whatever, and they're, you know, they're making disparaging remarks about Christians. I mean, how many disparaging remarks do we hear just this week because of the fact that, you know, the world was supposed to end, and you know, look at those crazy Christians, and what do they believe, and all that. And... We have to put up with that, and we have to try and give an answer to some degree to stand up for ourselves and yet still be salt and light. It's not easy, is it, at times? Nope. So even though we are not going through the exact kind of thing that the, the early Christians were going through at, in Acts, we still have to realize that there are times when it is not always easy to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things we recognize, I, I want to try and put you into the mind of Peter a bit here. Uh, we have this persecution that commences in chapter 12, and James had already been killed, and Peter really, he's next on the list. You know, I, I mean, it's very clear that it, apparently this is what's going to happen. And Herod was taking no chances. Uh, he, basically, Peter was in maximum security. Look at what it says, that he was uh, guarded by four squads of four soldiers each, and then, a little later on, in verse 6, it says Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. So, looking at it from a human point of view, was Peter going to get out? Was he going to be free? No. No. I mean, maybe... You know, and, 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 and work with me here a little bit. Maybe God could, you know, maybe God could break down the chains, but he couldn't get rid of the guards. Or maybe God could, you know, um, take care of some of the, the guards, but there's other things. We, we say those things, don't we? When we pray to God to deliver us from our bondage, we often will think and say, well, God, you can do such and such, or you can do so much, but you can't do everything. I wonder what was in Peter's mind. Uh, was he, you know, well, we'll get to that in just a moment, but I do want to underscore the fact that while Peter was going through this difficult time, the church of Jesus Christ was praying for him. Now, you know, sometimes I hesitate to talk a lot about prayer because prayer is something we sort of assume it, it, it's something we do, it should, it should be something we do, and we can always be more effective in it, but, you know, we talk about, oh, well, we're going to have a prayer. We're going to have a prayer meeting. We're going to have a time of prayer. But do we really, really, really believe that those prayers can be effective? I would like to challenge you this morning to believe that our prayers, especially our, us as a church, can be effective in releasing people from bondage. The prayers of the church can be effective in releasing believers who find themselves in situations they shouldn't be in, and they are clutching at straws, and we'll look at some of the examples of that in a moment, but uh, it's also effective in delivering people from the wrong path and bringing them into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I have, uh, I can give you examples even in my own family circle of people that I prayed for and family members that we prayed for for years. When I first became a Christian, you know, I thought that I was, I was much younger and, and I had a lot more enthusiasm than intelligence. But, uh, you know, I thought the way that I could witness to people, you know, especially my family, was just give them a new Bible every year for Christmas. And so after a while, some of my uh, family, you know, they had a nice stack of Bibles, which they had never read. They had never even opened them. But it was like, I felt like I was doing it. Well, who knows? But I know in, in one particular case, my brother-in-law and his wife, we prayed for probably 25 years. And in the last three to four years, they came to faith in Christ as a family. So prayer and the prayer of the church can be powerful in releasing people from the wrong path and finding the right road in Jesus Christ. So I want to underscore that. 
So we don't just sort of say, I oh, yeah, did prayer. Okay, well, we pray. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. But does it really matter? Does it really affect? I mean, God is, you know, what do we say? God is all-knowing. God is all, you know, he knows everything that's going to happen. So what, what possible effect can my prayer have? The scriptures teach us that it can have a lot of power and a lot of effect. So Peter is in prison. Peter is in bondage. He's secure. He's not going anywhere. The church is praying. And I asked the question, what was Peter thinking? Over in, uh, just over in John's Gospel, uh, in chapter 21, uh, verses 18 and 19, Jesus actually gave a bit of uh, prophecy uh, there in terms of what uh, is going to happen to Peter. He says, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you still want, you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Now, I can't help but think that Peter may have had these words of Jesus in his mind, and he might have been thinking, you know, Lord, maybe this is it. Now, we know from history, and as we read the scriptures, that it wasn't it yet. That, that Jesus' word of uh, foretelling, his foretelling, prophecy about Peter's upcoming death, would happen, as Jesus said, but it wouldn't be for a number of years. So, so I'm trying to think, is that what Peter was thinking in his mind? How was he preparing himself for death? And in spite of his reliance upon God, he must have had some down moments. I think it's very important that we as Christians are honest with ourselves and honest with you know, those around us and our fellow believers, and that, that we are not somehow completely immune from human thoughts in the middle of tough times. We have fears, we have concerns, we have doubts. And of course, you know, we, we sort of have grown up in the church and we've learned, well, we're not supposed to have those kinds of things. You know, a good Christ, Christian doesn't doubt. A good Christian doesn't, isn't afraid. But I want to submit to you that I think all of us are afraid. And all of us can doubt, depending on the situation. Um, I asked the question, are we ever in prison? Have you ever been in prison? In prison? Well, I mean, maybe, really. But have you ever been in prison in terms of emotional upheaval? Amen. You know, you, you, you know you need to be feeling better. You know you should be happy in Jesus. You know you should be excited about life, and you're not. You know, maybe you go through your day and... You have slumps. You have discouragement. Sometimes maybe you don't even know where it's coming from. You can't always link cause and effect. But you get into the slumps and you carry around, perhaps it's from grief, maybe the loss of a loved one or the loss of a relationship or, or whatever it is. And so we are not as up as we could be. And I think all too often in the church, we're taught, hey, we can always be happy in Jesus. And well, that's our goal, I guess. But the fact is, we're not. Maybe financial fractures, you know? I mean, we've had, over the last few uh, years, some tough times in terms of our economy. I was talking with someone just last night, and they were, again, it was in this context of the end of the world, and we were talking about white 2 k and, and one of my secondary careers has been in the computer industry. And I was telling them, I made a lot of money in 1999. Because everybody was buying new servers and new, you know, uh, networks and all of this because they had to be prepared for 2000, right? You remember that? But, uh, but that's, it's not been quite that good lately, you know? People I remember retired at 35 back in those days. But, but now it's a different thing. We've lost money on our homes. Maybe our, our you know, 401ks are depleted, um, you know? We're putting our kids through college, whatever it is, people are going through financial stress and struggle, and that can make us feel in bondage. You better believe it can. 